Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. And then one last matter of housekeeping, and that is that uh, I told him last night I probably wouldn't do this while he was here, but I'm going to embarrass him anyway. Last night, Ike Spiker had one of the greatest nights of his life. He started Dallas Seminary, first night, first year. In fact, Tommy Ice and I were talking about that on the phone yesterday afternoon about how how wonderful that was. We reflecting back on what a thrill that was that first day at Dallas Seminary in Dallas you'd walk through the parking lot and you'd see Dr. Ryrie's name or Dr. Walford's name or Dr. Pentecost's name on their parking space you'd just sit there and go this is holy ground you'd walk down the halls and you'd see their names on the their offices and you just you just couldn't believe it I mean just tremendous so I started last night but that puts this congregation in a new role and that is as a training congregation you haven't had that privilege yet. Of course, we're only a little over two years old, so we haven't had that opportunity. But now you do, that this will be one of the things that uh, this will be our first of hopefully many students that come through that start seminary and need to be trained so that they can eventually go pastor. So that means that we're going to get the opportunity to hear their very first sermons, their very first Bible classes, and get the opportunity to encourage them. And it's always great. I remember the last individual, I won't mention his name tonight, uh, I got to remember his church here visiting tonight, but you all know, probably know who I'm talking about. I remember the first time I called him up and I said, I got to go out of town in three months. You're going to cover for me. What? So I just worked him through, writing out all the lessons. Had the same response from Ike last week when I said, you know, I need somebody to teach Bible class when I go to Kiev. You're on. Pick a subject. We'll start working on it. So this will be a, a lot of excitement for the congregation to watch him as he grows, matures, and gets experience in that area over the next uh, four or five years. We're not going to let Ike squeeze four years into more than five. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure we're ready to focus on the Word this evening, and then I'll open in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful that we have you to come to, that you are intimately involved in every detail of our lives, and that you desire for us to bring our cares, our concerns, our anxieties, our our hopes, our dreams, our wishes before you. Father, we're especially thankful for the way you're working in Ike's life and his beginning of seminary. And Father, we pray that that would go well, and that you would. Uh, we know that in many ways you're going to teach him not just from. Uh, the academics, but also in the application of the Word. Father, again, we this evening, we, as we have prayed in prayer meeting, I want to pray for Alice Whitelock, as she is, a word is that she has pneumonia at 92. That is a very uh, distressing situation. Father, we just put her in your hands and pray that uh, this will be a great opportunity to uh, glorify you, however things work out. And now, Father, as we study your word, we pray that as we go through the life of Joseph, that we'd be challenged by the lessons that are there for us as we see doctrine uh, working itself out in the flesh of someone's life. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're in Genesis 37, a great story, one that's familiar to or should be familiar to uh, most of us. But there are some tremendous lessons that we can learn in Genesis chapter 37. We've gone through the first 11 verses, and last time I began to set up a framework that we can use in, applica- in, un- in, in application from these uh, stories. One of the, my favorite 
things about Old Testament people is that we see New Testament principles lived out in the lives of these Old Testament uh, believers. We see their successes, we see their failures, we see how individuals take those abstract principles that we talk about so often, whether it's grace orientation or doctrinal orientation or love for uh, one another, taking those principles and then applying them in situations that aren't too much different from situations that you and I face on a daily basis. So it puts uh, flesh and blood to abstract doctrine. And that's true for Joseph. Joseph is 17 years old here. He is already showing signs uh, that there is something special about him. He has already demonstrated a degree of reliability and dependability to his father. He is markedly different from his brothers. We've seen vignettes of his brothers already that they are not positive to doctrine, not concerned about spiritual things. They're uh, attracted to and assimilating to the pagan culture in the land of Canaan already. They, we've already seen the episode of the rape of Dinah in a uh, previous chapter and how the brothers brought uh, vengeance against the uh, those who lived in Shechem and all the males there that were responsible for that. So we don't have a good image of these brothers. They're irresponsible. They are pagan. They're not concerned about spiritual things. And they're, but in contrast, we have uh, young Joseph, who is the next to youngest of Jacob's sons. He is the firstborn of his favorite wife, Rachel. And earlier in chapter 37, it is Joseph that he sends out to uh, communicate to the, to the brothers as they're keeping the flocks. And remember, this was a large commercial enterprise for Jacob. He had numerous flocks of goats and sheep. He was extremely wealthy, and so it was these sons who were responsible for taking care of all of his physical assets and taking care of his wealth, and he did not uh, always trust them, and so he sends Joseph to uh, communicate with them to bring back messages and just to check on them. And we saw the, our first picture of Joseph is that he's coming back and bringing a, a bad report on the brothers, and that foreshadows this conflict that occurs within the family. Now, that's intensified by the fact that his father showed his favoritism of Joseph by giving him a special coat. Literally, it's a long tunic uh, with long sleeves. Uh, it's usually translated a uh, coat of many colors, although that's probably not an accurate translation. But it was a tunic that had special markings on it. It was uh, embroidered with uh, various different colored threads, which would indicate that Joseph was the designated heir or probably would be the designated heir. And so this just intensified the antagonism, resentment, jealousy that the brothers had for him. And so three times we're told that the brothers hate him and they hate him so much that they can't even have a, a peaceable word with him. And twice we have in this previous section an emphasis on that word uh, shalom, that they can't speak in a manner that's uh, uh, of peace with him. They hate him so much his very presence just drives them deep into mental attitude, sins of bitterness and resentment and anger and vengeance motivation. And that is the uh, crux of the story and at the, of the whole Joseph episode. As I, just to remind you that what we see here is a, a spiritual principle, uh, a theological and doctrinal principle, that God is working in the midst of all the negative things that happen to bring about his purposes so that when all is said and done, after all the brothers have done in their rejection and hostility to Joseph, at the end he says to them, because they're worried after Jacob dies that, that uh, Joseph will execute vengeance on them, which is what they would have done. And jo uh, Joseph says, y you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The New Testament, we saw that in the in the principle of Romans 8.28, that we know that he works or causes all things to work together for good to those that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is working in the midst of this to take 
the family of Jacob down to Egypt for a special time of protection and provision. It will be a hard time just because God wants them there and God's taking them there doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It's going to be a time of slavery. And there's a principle there that just because you're where God wants you doesn't mean it's going to be uh, a wonderful, happy, glorious uh, time of wonderful circumstances. It may be very harsh circumstances, but God has you there for a purpose. All right, well, we come to our first section in verses 12 through uh, 14. 12 through 14, and here we begin to get introduced to this training process that God has. Last time, I w- started to set up this this framework of application that I want us to have firmly embedded in our minds. So I want to review for just a minute, run through it very quickly to get this back into your head. We are in a training program as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is training us to be leaders, not just in time, but in eternity. Right now, your leadership responsibilities may function in a small area. Uh, Maybe it's a large area. Maybe it's just your home. Maybe it's just you if you're single. Maybe it's at work. Maybe there's a few more people you're responsible for. Maybe God's given you responsibilities over other areas. Maybe you're uh, a leader. Uh, Some of you leaders here in the local church. Others are leaders in other areas of life. But all of us are being trained to be leaders in the millennial kingdom. Revelation 20, verse 6 tells us that we shall be, that is, those who are part of the first resurrection, church age, which includes church-age believers, that we will be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him for a thousand years. So we are in this training program to be able to have the capacity to rule and reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom. So we have a training program, and this is my favorite blueprint. We start with salvation in phase one. Phase two, we go through one of two cycles in our living. The upper cycle, indicated by the green arrows, indicates a cycle of life. This is when we're in fellowship, abiding with Christ, walking by the Spirit. The bottom cycle in red indicates walking in Uh, darkness, walking under the control of the sin nature, and what happens as a result of that. After we die, we go into phase three, and then there will be the judgment seat of Christ, where we are rewarded for that which is produced while we're walking by the Spirit, the divine good that has eternal value, or there's a loss of rewards and temporary shame as a result of failure. We look briefly at James 1, 2 through 4, which outlines this process, summarizes it, that we are to count it joy. It's a mental attitude thing. It's not just, he doesn't say be happy. It's not focusing on an emotion of uh, thrill or enthusiasm. It is a mental attitude, count it joy. He uses a, an accounting term to add up all your circumstances, add up the realities of doctrine, and come to a conclusion of joy, peace, stability, tranquility. Uh, Whenever you fall into various trials, because you know something, there's doctrine in your soul. You understand the training principle and procedure that God has to test the doctrine in our soul because we know that the testing of our faith, that is the testing not of our ability to believe, but of the doctrine in our soul, the content there produces endurance. And endurance then uh, has a maturing impact that you may be spiritually mature and complete, lacking in nothing. Now, there's a parallel passage to this that I thought about last week, and I want to read through, read to you this evening that ties in with that. And it's found at the beginning of Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, Paul says in the opening two verses that we have peace with God because of justification. As a result of justification, it impacts our life afterwards. And he says not only do we glory, rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, a future orientation. He says not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character. See, it's the same 
thing that James is saying. We go through testing, we go through adversity, and it produces endurance. That see, what James is saying is the testing of our faith produces endurance. Paul says that we glory in tribulation because of our mental attitude, not because we're a bunch of masochists who are into uh, self-inflicted misery and pain, but because we understand that the suffering, the adversity that we go through living in a fallen world is, is under the ultimate control of God, and it produces something. So we're able to glory, to exalt, to almost boast, is the idea of that word, in tribulations, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance produces character. That's what we're going to see in these two or three, next two or three chapters with Joseph is how God is producing character in Joseph so that Joseph can be the kind of leader that is necessary to protect his people. See, we don't know where God's taking us. Joseph, when Joseph is in the pit, when he's in that cistern and his brothers are threatening to kill him, Joseph has no idea where God's going to take him. He has a hint because of the dreams that he's had. But in the moment, there is distress, as we'll see, anxiety in his soul because of the circumstances. But God's using that to produce character. He's in that training process. And character produces hope. And we all know that hope is a Greek, based on the Greek word elpis, meaning a confident expectation. It is forward-looking. It is anticipatory. It looks to where God is taking us. It's that concept of the personal sense of our eternal destiny. And then he goes, Paul goes on to say, Now hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And this is love from God. It is what's called an objective genitive indicating that God's love for us is made manifest to us. And as we come to learn how much God loves us, it creates a reciprocal response, increasing our love for him, which motivates us on into maturity. And so we're going to look at some of those elements as well as we go through this. Now, I'll just skip this second diagram here. 1 Corinthians 10.13 is another promise that all of you should memorize. I don't know what's happened with Scripture memory. I, I hesitate to embarrass anybody. I wouldn't dare ask you to raise your hands if you are consistently memorizing Scripture, but that is something we ought to do. I was talking with a pastor today, and I was telling him that I, that uh, uh, I'm working through several things that I am memorizing. I said, what are you memorizing? Well, I'm not memorizing anything. You're a pastor and you're not memorizing Scripture? And that's one of the things I appreciate about, about Jim Myers is Jim has memorized copious amounts of Scripture. and He's a tremendous encouragement to me in that area. But that's something that's not emphasized anymore. And that's something we do emphasize in prep school. And as I told the prep school's uh, teachers when we first started putting things together, that if you take a third grader or a fourth grader or a fifth grader, 30 years from now, they may not remember your name or what you said in class, but if, they, if you have them memorize 10 Bible verses during the year and over the course of their prep school career, they are, those 10 verses are reinforced in other classes and they're reminded of them, then those verses will stay with them in their soul for the rest of their life. And so I'd almost rather them not learn anything as long as they are come out of the end of the year with 10 or 12 Bible verses memorized. So this is, this is uh, very important. And 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is one of those basic verses everybody ought to have memorized. It's a tremendous comfort in times of adversity. No testing has come upon you except that which is common to man. You can tell I memorized it in a different version from this one. Uh, but God is faithful, always at focus, no matter what the test is, no matter how extreme the adversity, you always end up with God is faithful. Well, 
if you only knew my background, if you only knew what my parents did, if you only knew what uh, happened to me in school, if you only knew what, it doesn't matter. God is faithful, it's, but God is faithful. No matter what the test is, God is faithful and will not allow us to be tested beyond our ability. Now, as I pointed out last time, I think what that is referring to is that God's not going to test you beyond the capability of God the Holy Spirit who indwells you and the principles and promises of the Word of God which He has given you. So if you haven't learned about those yet, you're going to hit some tests and say, why is God taking me through this? It's to drive you to the Word to learn what He's provided for you. And He will, with the testing, also make a way of escape, not to get away from it, but to bear up under it. That's that same concept. It's not the same word, but it's the same concept of endurance. The Greek word for endurance is hupomeno. That's the verb. Hupomeno. Meno is a word meaning to stay, to abide. It's the word we'll, we'll get sick of on Thursday night as we go through John 15, where Jesus says that we need to abide in him. That's that same word. When you intensify it with the preposition hupa, it means to remain or abide under something. That means to stay in the pressure cooker. See, 1 Corinthians 10.13 isn't a safety valve that allows you to jump out of the pressure cooker. It is a tool to allow you to stay in the pressure cooker of the adversity with peace and stability and contentment because you know what? Doctrine in your soul. You know that testing has a purpose, and you know that God is in control. This is what Joseph has to learn. Now, his preparation is given in verses 12 through 14, or the preparation for the situation. His brothers are feeding their father's flock in Shechem. So the brothers have now taken the flock up to the hill country of Ephraim. This is in the central part of Israel. It's during the summertime, probably, the uh, vegetation down here in the south would have become scarce, so they've taken the uh, flock up to Shechem. And it is in the area of Shechem that they have had the previous experience of uh, the rape of Dinah, which was covered back in Genesis uh, chapter 34. And there we saw how the brothers, you know, J Jacob had moved there, he'd lived there seven or eight years, and there they began to enter into the uh, activities of the Canaanites, and they began to be assimilated, and the brothers began to become comfortable with the Canaanite culture. And so this isn't that long ago. It's only been a couple of years now since that happened, since they uh, massacred all the young men in Shechem as a result of their uh, convincing them that all would be well and that Dinah could marry into the Shechemite clan as long as uh, they got circumcised. And then as soon as all the men were circumcised and in pain, uh, Levi and uh, Reuben came in and killed them all. So that just shows their vindictiveness. So Jacob's probably concerned about what's going on now that these brothers are all back up there in Shechem. So he wants to send Joseph to uh, watch over them to bring back a report and find out what's going on. And so uh, we learn a principle here about Joseph in terms of his preparation for uh, leadership, and that is that a leader is someone who's reliable. Jacob has always already given him uh, responsibilities to report on the brothers, and he's continuing to do that because he knows that Joseph is going to give him an honest report. Joseph is not involved in mental attitude sins against his brothers. They're involved in bitterness and anger toward him, but he will bring an honest report. He has his father's best interests uh, at heart, and so Jacob knows that he is reliable that he can be given a task and be confident that he will carry out the task. But the task is not without its obstacles. And often in life we're given responsibilities and we face obstacles. And so uh, we're told that Jacob, uh, Joseph goes looking for the brothers. 
And in verse 15, we read that he gets lost. So he goes out from, look back to the map, he goes out from Hebron down here in the south, and he heads uh, north up past Jericho up into the uh, southern part of the hill country of Ephraim to, to Shechem, but he can't find his brothers. This is a journey, by the way, of about 50 miles. Now, as he's wandering around up here in the hill country of Shechem, trying to find uh, his brothers, he runs into this one man. Now, the man is not mentioned. In older commentaries, they thought this was uh, perhaps a theophany, such as the man who appeared to uh, Jacob at Peniel and wrestled with him, but there we learn that was the angel of the Lord. There's no indication anywhere in the text that this man is anyone other than an individual that God brought into uh, Joseph's path to, to help him help him along. So in verse 15 we read, Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. He's lost. He can't find his brothers, but he hasn't given up. He's not going home. He is uh, going to persevere. So he is already learning that important uh, characteristic of endurance and perseverance. He's given a task, and he's going to stick with it despite obstacles. He can't find him anywhere, and he's wandering around lost for a while. And the man says, what are you seeking? Verse 16, so Joseph said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they're feeding their flocks. And the man said, they've departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now, Dothan was located uh, about 15 miles to the, let me get rid of that, about 15 miles to the northwest of Shechem up near Mount Ebal. And it uh, was an area there where the brothers had found better pasture, and so they're there with the flocks, and then they see Joseph coming. Verse 17, or verse 18. This is where we see their reaction. Now, before we go on, there's two doctrines that we need to emphasize in what we've seen so far, and these relate to uh, two, two closely related doctrines. One is... Uh, the providence of God and the other is divine guidance. Providence of God and divine guidance. In the providence of God, as we've already seen, that's a major doctrine in this whole episode with Joseph. God is working covertly behind the scenes to bring about his purposes. Providence is part of the sovereignty of God. God is sovereign. He is the ultimate ruler of history, the ultimate controller of history and controller of destinies. He does so without uh, violating human responsibility. We're not a bunch of robots, but he does it in a way that is probably far beyond our comprehension. So we see how the providence of God is bringing Joseph there for a particular reason, and that even though Joseph is unaware of the, what the greater plan is, God is still bringing it about. The second thing we notice here has to do with divine guidance. Now, we've gone through principles of divine guidance in this class in the last four or five months, and I want you to notice that how God is guiding and directing Joseph. It is not through overt means. God is not uh, manifesting himself to Joseph in a theophany. God the Holy Spirit is not whispering in Joseph's ear. God is using circumstances to direct Joseph in his, in his search and in his life. So this again shows that when we're trusting God, we can relax and let God uh, work things out, and work things together uh, for good. It is not necessary to have direct revelation, which is what most people think of as divine guidance. You sit down, you have a problem, oh Lord, tell me what to do. The Lord sa says, well, study the word and apply doctrine. And so he's going to, as long as we're trusting him, God will work things out. And that's what happens here. But what we learn is, as God is working things out, 
It's not good. Some people have misunderstood and misquoted Romans 8.28 to the effect that, that all things are good. That's not what the verse says. And we know that all things are good. It doesn't say that. And we know that he causes all things to work together for good. So even the all things may be bad. It is bad that, the, that Joseph's brothers are angry with him. It is bad that they hate him. It is bad that they won't even speak peaceably to him. It is bad that they are going to uh, uh, throw him in a pit. It's bad that they want to kill him. It's bad that they're going to sell him into slavery. But God is going to work all of those negative things together for his, for ultimate good and for his purposes. But we just don't see that when we're in the midst of those difficult circumstances. So before we move on to verse 18, one more principle on leadership training, and that is that a leader can be depended upon to get the job done despite obstacles, despite difficulties, despite the fact that that he got lost, that he didn't know where he was. He could have easily just said, well, I can't find them. There's a lot of land here. They could be anywhere. I'm just going to have to assume everything's okay. I'm just going to go back home. He stayed there even though he was lost, waiting, hoping that uh, God would provide information for him, and that's what happened. Now in verse 18, we see the brothers, the conspiracy, their plan to uh, deceive Jacob, their plan to uh, kill Joseph, and later they modified that plan. When they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, so he is wearing his his coat, his special coat that would indicate his office, his position as the uh favorite son and the heir. So that tells us something about Joseph's character. He's either one of two things. Either he is extremely arrogant and he just wants to rub his brother's nose in it, which doesn't fit the picture here. Or he recognizes this this coat that his father gave him is significant and it is a badge of his office and responsibility within the family and he is on his father's business and so it is the proper garment to wear and so he is wearing that and it makes him uh, obvious so the brothers look across the the way and they can see him coming quite at quite a distance and it gives them time to get angry to remember how he's uh, not only the father's favorite, but he's also had these two dreams from God, which indicate that they are all going to bow down and serve Joseph. And they are, as soon as they start thinking about that, it takes, they go from zero to uh, attempted murder in about 3.5 seconds. They just get all worked up, and it's not, it doesn't take them long to hatch a plot. So they conspire to uh, kill him, uh, against him, to kill him. And the word here for conspire is the Hebrew verb nakal, which means to be deceitful, to cheat, to plan to do something against someone. Uh, it has the idea of intending to trick or to deal cunningly with somebody. Numbers 25, verse 18. This word is only used three other times in the Old Testament, and it indicates that they are definitely doing something to cheat him out of his birthright, that their father is going to give him the inheritance, but they want to cheat him out of it. They want to deceive. As we've seen, the concept of deception is a key theme throughout this section. It reminds us of dear old Daddy Jacob, who was the great heel grabber, deceiver, and a con artist himself, and Uncle Laban was a con artist, and remember Laban is their grandfather, Jacob's uh, uncle, but their grandfather, so they've come by this honestly, and they conspire against him to kill him, that is to put him to death, and the word that we have here is the Hebrew word mut, which means to uh, to simply die. It's a hyphial infinitive construct here, plus the uh, preposition meaning to, which makes it gives it the uh, nuance of an infinitive. This is just a general word 
for killing, for death. Uh, in some passages, it has the idea of meaning to execute. The verb is used uh, some 600 or some 800 times in the Old Testament. In the uh, cow stem, it simply means to, to die. So here it has the idea of causing him to die in the hiphil, which is a causative stem, to put him to death. Now, the Bible uses a number of different words for death and for killing. We have another word that is used in uh, Scripture, shachat, which means to slaughter or to kill. It occurs in the Hebrew Bible about 80 times. It first appeared in Genesis 22.10 when Abraham was instructed to take his knife and to slay his son. And this word shachat is often used in reference to killing in a sacrifice. It's used about 30 times in Hebrew, I mean, in, in, uh, in Leviticus. So when we read that word shachat, it has the idea of a sacrificial slaying. Then another word that we have is the uh, Hebrew word harag, which means to kill, to slay, or destroy. It's used about 170 times in the Hebrew Old Testament to indicate the taking of life, whether animal or human. And it first appears in the Old Testament in the Cain and Abel episode where Cain slays Abel. So it can have the idea of, of murder. Uh, the previous word, does, uh, shachat, does not have the idea of murder, but it's primarily associated with sacrificial killing. Harag does have the idea of of murder in some cases, a few cases suggesting premeditated killing or murder, although often it is broader than that. Now, this is not the word that we find in Exodus 20.13, the sixth commandment, which says, thou shalt not kill. See, there are many people who think that that's an accurate translation in the King James Version. But the word that we have there is this word, ratzach. And ratzach is a more technical word, meaning to kill uh, in the sense of premeditated murder or to slay. It occurs about 40 times in the Old Testament. Its concentration is in the Pentateuch with reference to uh, premeditated murder uh, precepts and laws and ordinances in the uh, in the Torah. So Exodus 20:13 should be translated, "Thou shalt not murder." And there are so many people who have just, by, because of a bad translation, they have just uh, misapplied that. And every now and then you run into some of these people that are a little bit off-center, I think, that are King James-only Christians. I don't know if you've ever run into a King James-only person, but there's, these people believe that the King James, only tra- the King James translation was inspired by God just as much as the original Greek or Hebrew. And uh, th- these are the people who say, well, you know, the King James Version was good enough for the Apostle Paul. It's good enough for us. <sighs> so they, they I mean, and there's a number of folks like that today. It's gained in popularity. Forty years ago, it didn't exist, but that was before many of the modern translations came out. And since the mid-70s, this movement has increased and its and its influence. So you always have to be careful because they're gonna, uh, they don't want to, they don't care whether anybody knows Greek or Hebrew. King James is good enough for them. But when we go back to the original language, we realize that even in Elizabethan English, they understood these nuances, and so often words that were used in the. Uh, King James Version had a different nuance at that time than it does today. Incidentally, the King James Version itself was modified several times. The one that most people think of as the King James or Authorized Version of 1611, the one you probably have at home, is actually a revision that was made in the 1780s. So very few people today actually could understand the original 1611 Authorized Version authorized version. So we have in our passage a simple statement that they want to kill him, and it's up to the context for us to determine whether this is legitimate or illegitimate. Murder, of course, was supposed to be penalized by the death penalty. This was initially authorized in the uh, Noahic covenant, and in the Noahic covenant, God mandated that whoever sheds 
man's blood, by man his blood should also be shed. And so you have the use of that terminology that whoever sheds man's blood, that is an idiom for a violent death, a death associated with murder, and it doesn't mean literally to shed blood. Murder can be accomplished through poison, through hitting somebody over the head, through strangling them, any number of means that don't involve the shedding of blood. But that is the picture there. It's an idiom for uh, murder. You see the same thing in, uh, in the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law is not the basis for capital punishment. I remember when I was in the seventh grade, I wrote a paper on capital punishment for an, for an English essay. And um, that was when the Lord was starting to teach me how to handle the word a little better. And the, the, my, lit- my uh, English teacher wrote on there, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I had to come home and ask my mother, say, okay, how do I handle this? So God has delegated responsibility to us. And Numbers 35, uh, 33 says, So you shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land. That is, the worst pollution, according to the Scripture, that you can have is the pollution of murder and violent crimes. Now, I wonder if any of the greenies think about that, that the worst pollution that we have in this country isn't that that's produced by the oil companies in their attempt to to find oil and produce oil so that we can have plenty of energy, but it's produced by gang members who kill people and drive-by shooters and all these uh, criminals who have committed murder that we have in our prisons. They defile the land. So Numbers 35 says, You shall not pollute the land where you are, for blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land because the, literally that force should be because, because the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. In other words, it's saying no atonement can be made for the pollution of murders in the land other than the blood of him who shed it. That's the only way you can cleanse the land from these murderers is through capital punishment. So God under God is more concerned about the victim than he is about the criminal. Verse 19. As they conspire with one another, they say, look, the dreamer's coming. So that tells us that the first thing in their mind is these dreams that Joseph has had. That's the, their initial reaction is, look, here comes the dreamer. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit and we shall say some wild beast has devoured him we'll just throw him in a pit and let him starve to death actually the word there for pit is that of a of a cistern and the word there for beating is i mean for killing is a different word this is the hebrew word naka meaning to beat or to strike or to wound it's a word that is often used in a number of different legal texts in the Torah, the law, the actually the word Torah means instruction for life. Uh, Exodus twenty one twelve. He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. That's uh, another instantiation of the death penalty. Literally, it's he who beats a man. Uh, whoever Leviticus twenty four seventeen. Whoever kills any man, and there it's the same word. Beating a man shall surely be put to death. Leviticus twenty four twenty one. Whoever kills an animal. Uh, shall restore it, but whoever kills a man shall be put to death. In both places, it's the word nacha for beating. Deuteronomy 19.21, Your eye shall not pity, life shall be for life, eye shall be for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So they are engaged in a conspiracy to commit a capital crime. They want to separate his soul from his body, his Nefesh. Now, he's got a, a, a friend in Reuben. Now, we remember Reuben a little bit. If you turn back a couple of pages, we'll discover that, that Reuben wanted to exercise his uh, power over Jacob and exercise his adolescent rebelliousness. And in uh, Genesis thirty five twenty two, Reuben went in and had uh, sexual relations with Bilhah, his father's concubine. 
So Reuben is not in favor with his father, and perhaps that's his motivation here. We're not told. But when Reuben realizes what they're going to do, and remember, Reuben is the eldest. He is the firstborn. He is the one who should have been the designated heir. So he's the one who has the most to lose, as it were, if Joseph becomes the designated heir. But Reuben has uh, remarkably had a change of thought here, or perhaps he is going to try to get back into his father's graces. We don't know what his motivation was. Verse 21, but Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let's not kill him. So he begins to argue, let's let's come up with another plan. And verse 22, he says to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him. Now, secretly, he had a plan. That's what's at the end of verse 22 in that appositional phrase, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. See, Reuben decided if they throw him in this pit, and this is what he's talking about here, the word for a pit is a cistern. And a cistern was a place that in the dry country of Israel, they would dig these pits, and some of them would hold uh, 10 or 12,000 gallons. Others were quite large and might hold as many as much as 50 or 60,000 gallons. And when it would rain, that would collect all the rainwater. And uh, that's this is one of the cisterns at uh, Qumran. And then this is another cistern in, uh, where was this, Arad, uh, I believe, or, or Beersheba. And this, this, there were these cisterns around the land, and so there was an empty one that was dry. And as the text says, and they were going to uh, throw him into that. And that's what they did in verse 24. Now, Reuben's plan was that they would put him in there, and then he would come back in the middle of the night, and he would get Joseph out and rescue him. But his brothers don't know that. And apparently Reuben left. You know, they come up with their plan, and he's gone, and the plan changed. Verse 23. So it came to pass when Joseph arrived, when he came to his brothers, that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of uh, many colors, the, the special tunic that was on him, and they took him and cast him into a cistern. And the cistern was empty. There was no water in it. See, that's why it makes that observation there that it was uh, no water was there. It's a cistern. Verse 25, and they sat down to eat a meal. Now, I want you to go back to verse 20 because we have an interesting play on, on, on words here. In verse 20, we have this image. They're going to come up with a rationale for how how Joseph died. They say, come therefore, let us now kill him, cast him into a cistern, and then we'll say some beast devoured him. So what's going to happen? So they're going to throw him in a pit, and while he's at right after they throw him in the pit, they're going to sit down and have lunch. So there's they're going to be eating while he's in the pit, and the image that the writers convey here is they're acting like wild beasts. They're the ones who are devouring their meal. The same Hebrew word akal is used in, in both places. And so as they sit down to devour their meal, then they lift up and looked, lift up their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels. Uh, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. Now, I want you to notice in this verse that it's talking about a group of of uh, Ishmaelites. A group of Ishmaelites are the descendants of Ishmael. Abraham was married to Sarah. When Sarah didn't have didn't get pregnant, she said, "Go ahead, take our Egyptian slave girl Hagar as your wife, and." Uh, she'll produce an, uh, an heir for you. And so Abraham did what his wife suggested, and the offspring was Ishmael. And now Ishmael was not the promised seed. Ishmael is eventually, after Isaac was born, Ishmael had to leave, and Hagar and Ishmael went off across the Jordan, and God prospered Ishmael. And so several generations later now, there the Ishmaelites have grown to a large enough group to where they're involved in trade. But they're also called Midianites in verse 28. If you look down a couple of verses, we read, Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit. Verse 
verse, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here on my slide. Let me back up a minute. So they're going to uh, pull him out of the pit. Now the Midianites are also were also descendants of of uh, Abraham. When Sarah died, he remarried at Keturah, and one of the children that he had with Keturah was Midian. So Midian is a half brother, a full would be a half brother to Isaac, and the, and Midian was a half brother to Ishmael. So apparently their lines were already intermarrying, so that the terms were beginning to be used interchangeably. And now they're going to sell him and put him into uh, into slavery instead of killing him. Now, one of the th- things that we should think about here is what reaction does Joseph have? Here's Joseph in the pit. His brothers, his flesh and blood, half, most of them half-brothers, have planned this and they put him into the pit. Now, Genesis uh, 37 doesn't tell us anything about his attitude, but if we go over to chapter 42, verse 21, we read that the brothers, when they're feeling guilty later on now, that by chapter 42, Joseph is in power in, in Egypt. They don't know that, though. They're going there for, uh, to, to find food, and, of course, they have a guilty conscience. And so their comment to one another is, we're truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. So we see that this word anguish and distress is used here. It's a word that can refer to external uh, adversity or can refer, as it does in the first usage, of the inner turmoil in the soul. It's from the uh, Hebrew word sarach, meaning adversity, trouble, distress, anguish. It refers to a situation or a time of extreme discomfort an affliction that can come for various different reasons. So this is the beginning of Joseph's testing here. How is he going to handle the rejection from his own brothers, from his own family? And apparently he was quite upset over this. He may have pleaded for his life, some we don't really know, but he does have anguish in his soul, which would indicate that he's not Uh, fully trusting God in the midst of the circumstance. This word for anguish or distress, sarah, shows up in various other places. Uh, Here he pleads with them. This is the word hanan, meaning simply to be gracious to him. And this would be normal for any of us, that if someone turns against us, we would try to convince them otherwise. So I don't really think that Joseph is uh, begging for his life or there's anything very negative going on here. He's just uh, pleading that they were trying to uh, negotiate with them that they would not carry that out. But this word uh, for adversity is used in some key passages. Job 5.19, we're told, He shall deliver you in six troubles. That's the word. Yes, in seven, no evil shall touch you. See, Joseph and us should be responding to any kind of, hus- any kind of adversity, distress, by claiming promises, by relaxing in God's provision. This is how the word is used many times in the wisdom literature of Job and also in Psalms. Psalm 9.9 says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. That's that same word that's used there, sarach, is used for a time of difficulty, a time of trouble. And so Joseph's mental attitude here should be one of trusting God, relying upon not putting his eyes on the circumstances, not putting his eyes on his brothers, but trusting God. God is training him for leadership because he's getting, he is going to be the number two person in Egypt, and it's going to be his responsibility to take the Egyptian empire through one of the greatest times of adversity they'll ever go through. And he needs to be a man who can be stable and relaxed in times of incredible pressure. So God is beginning to uh, train him. Now in verse 25 we read that these Ishmaelites have come up, and this is a picture indicating the use of camels. This is one of the earliest uses of camels. That's a big debate that liberals have. They said, well, they didn't have camels that early. And, of course, archaeology has come along to show that 
camels were in use in the Middle East uh, much earlier than this. So once again, uh, liberal theology has been uh, proved to be completely false. Now we go on and we read in verse uh, 26, So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? See, he's focused on the monetary aspect. This is the word betza, meaning uh, profit or gain. It can refer to dishonest gain or covetousness. It's a word that has a negative connotation, referring to illegal or unjust gain or profit, which God's people were to avoid. But Judah is saying, well, let's see what we can get out of this. So we see Reuben brought out as someone who's thinking, okay, let me see if I can get Joseph out of this mess. But Judah says, ah, let's not kill him. Uh, then we won't get anything for ourselves. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and at least we can get a little money for him. So they sell him for 20 shekels of silver, which was about half the going price of a slave at that time, and that would allow the Ishmaelites a little profit margin when they got to Egypt. But then Reuben returns. Now, Reuben's not there when this happens, which is uh, inferred from what happens. When he comes back to the cistern that night in verse 29, Joseph isn't there, and he is just beside himself with grief. He tears his clothes. He goes to his brothers, and they don't tell him what happened. Isn't that interesting? He goes back. He says, the Lord's no more. Uh, what shall I do? Where shall I go? He is just beside himself and taking all the guilt upon himself. And they don't say, no, he, he's not dead. We just sold him as a slave. And then they go through the whole ruse to deceive Jacob. And they took Joseph's uh, tunic and they, they destroyed it. Their, their hate is, and they, they got some pleasure out of this. Here's this symbol of their father's love for Joseph. And they're going to kill an animal and kill a goat and uh, put his, and soak the uh, robe, the tunic, in the blood in order to uh, make it seem as if a wild animal has actually killed Joseph. So when they bring it home to Jacob, Jacob is just inconsolable, verse 34. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, and mourned for his son many days. This is a typical mode of of mourning at that time. And all of his sons and all of his da daughters arose to comfort him. All of his daughters, he just had one daughter, but this would include his granddaughters, arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted, for he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. And his father wept for them. And then the concluding verse is, Now the Midianites had sold him, Joseph, in Egypt to Potiphar. So Joseph goes from being the prized favorite son at the beginning of the chapter to being a slave in Egypt at the end of the chapter. And the future of Abraham's seed is now out of the land. So always keep your eye on the land here. God is doing something to take that will end up taking them out of the land. Now next week, we're going to come back to one of the most bizarre episodes in the Old Testament in chapter 38, which is an interlude to contrast the depravity of Judah with the nobility of Joseph. And so beware, next week is, is almost an X-rated text from the Scripture itself. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your Word, begin to look at these things and study them. And we pray that you would help us to see the application in our own lives. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.